There are very few things on the internet I've ever seen that made me feel the way I did when I first watched the interrogation of Stephanie Lazarus. To see an LAPD officer sitting in an interview room, believing she had been called in to give advice about a case, not knowing that she was actually being interrogated for a horrendous crime she had committed decades beforehand, one she thought she had got away with, and then watching the fear and the panic take over as she slowly realises the daunting reality unfolding before her. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. It was like the greatest crime drama of all time. But it was real. Afterwards, I read up on the story out of curiosity, and once I started, I couldn't stop. This horrendous tale had it all. It was a heart-wrenching story of unrequited love, with grave consequences. Consequences that remained an unsolved mystery for 23 years. Today, we're going to untangle this dramatic web of lies, jealousy, deceit, and ultimately, cold-blooded murder. So, how did it happen? How did this officer of the law, a detective herself, end up on the wrong side of an interrogation room? What happened 23 years ago? How did she get away with it for over two decades? And why did she commit the crime in the first place? Well, to answer these questions, we have to go back to where it all began. But before we start, I would just like to state a disclaimer. I would like to make it clear that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes only, and the information contained in it is an amalgamation of hours of research carried out using a variety of sources on the internet. Even trustworthy and reliable sources can get things wrong, so if there's any information in this video that you know to be inaccurate, please feel free to respectfully update it in the comment section down below. So, today we're going to be looking at the cold-blooded murder of Sherry Rasmussen. We're going to look at the sequence of events that led up to that fateful day, the gruesome details of the murder itself, the failed investigations that took place following her death, the reopening of the cold case files decades later, the anxiety-inducing interrogation of Stephanie Lazarus, and the dramatic final conclusions to this horrific tale as the judicial system closes its doors on the case. For those of you who have made it this far, knowing what's in store and still wishing to continue, sit back and enjoy the video. It all began in the early 80s at UCLA, where John Rutten, a mechanical engineering major from San Diego, met a political science major from Simi Valley, called Stephanie Lazarus. Both were avid athletes, with Rutten being a keen runner and Lazarus playing for the UCLA junior varsity basketball team. The pair began dating, but the relationship never progressed past anything more than just a casual affair. The couple were never exclusive, and both Lazarus and Rutten dated several other people during their time at college. But despite this, Lazarus showed early signs of obsession over Rutten. While he showered, Lazarus would often steal Rutten's clothes, and at night, she would take photographs of him naked while he slept. Rutten was often unsettled by her unusual behaviour, but the pair had great chemistry, and he had a real soft spot for Lazarus, so the pair continued seeing each other after their time at UCLA. After graduating, Rutten accepted a job with disk drive company Micropolis, and Lazarus applied to the Los Angeles Police Department's Academy, becoming a uniformed officer in 1983. Although the pair slept together on multiple occasions over a three-year period, and even went on several holidays together, Rutten never considered the relationship anything more than just young kids fooling around. Soon after, Rutten met Sherry Rasmussen, a graduate of Loma Linda University and a director of nursing at Glendale Adventist Medical Center. She was a bright and accomplished woman, having gone to college aged just 16, and was on a fast career track in critical care nursing. Her father quotes her as saying that she was going to elevate the stature of nursing in the nation and believe that she was well on her way. On Rutten's 25th birthday, Lazarus threw him a surprise party, unaware that he had even been seeing other women. As time went on, Rutten and Rasmussen's relationship became more serious, and when Lazarus eventually found out, she was heartbroken. Her romantic relationship with Rutten faded, and soon after, he proposed to Rasmussen. Throughout all of this, Lazarus and Rutten remained friends, and she stayed in contact with his family. When she learned of his engagement to Rasmussen, she wrote a letter to Rutten's mother, saying, I'm truly in love with John, and the past year has really torn me up. 
I wish it didn't end the way it did, and I don't think I'll ever understand his decision. Soon after, Lazarus visited Rutten in his condo, and asked him to sleep with her one last time for closure, which despite being engaged, he reluctantly agreed to. Two days later, Lazarus visited Rasmussen in the hospital she worked at to tell her that things weren't over between her and Rutten, and that her and Rutten had slept together again. The confrontation at the hospital then escalated and got highly aggressive, with security having to be called to control the situation. Before being escorted off the premises, Lazarus told Rasmussen, if I can't have John, no one else will. And the intimidation didn't stop there. During the time that Rutten and Rasmussen were engaged, Lazarus visited their home on multiple occasions. At one point, Lazarus came to the couple's apartment in revealing workout clothes and asked Rutten to wax her skis, which he reluctantly agreed to. Several days later, whilst Rasmussen was home alone, Lazarus returned to the apartment to pick up the skis, armed and in uniform. Rasmussen became deeply unnerved by the visit and pleaded with Rutten to tell Lazarus to stop coming by, but he told her that there was nothing to worry about and that they were just friends. Rasmussen later confided to her father that she feared that Lazarus was stalking her in the streets. Despite their troubles, in November of 1985, John Rutten and Sherry Rasmussen got married. On the morning of the 24th of February 1986, John Rutten left the apartment that he shared with Sherry Rasmussen to go to work. Rasmussen was scheduled to give a motivational talk at work that day, but felt that the tactic was ineffective, so told Rutten that she was considering phoning in sick to avoid it. At 9.45am, a neighbour noticed that the garage door was wide open, and that the garage appeared empty, with no car parked inside it. Around 15 minutes later, Rutten called home, but no one answered. This would be the first of several unanswered calls he would make during the course of the day. Around midday, a maid was cleaning a property nearby when she heard what she said sounded like fighting, followed by something falling. When Rutten returned home from work that evening, he noticed that Rasmussen's car was missing from the drive. Feeling that something wasn't quite right, he walked cautiously into the living room, and that was where he found Sherry, his wife and the love of his life, lying dead on the living room floor. It was a disturbing scene. She had been bludgeoned and shot several times, and there were signs of a struggle. Wounds on Rasmussen's wrists and cords on the floor suggested she had been tied up at some point. A vase appeared to have been smashed over her head prior to the shooting. The credenza had been toppled, and there was a bloody handprint next to the burglar alarm's panic button. Hours before, Lazarus had been in that very same living room, committing a cold-blooded murder. Jealousy and rage had overcome her, and with Rutten at work, she once again headed for the couple's apartment. She picked the lock and entered the property, and as Rasmussen realised she was there, Lazarus fired a shot at her from her 38 calibre revolver. The shot missed, shattering a window behind Rasmussen, and she ran, but Lazarus chased her down. Rasmussen was taller than Lazarus, and strong, she stood at over six foot tall and was in good physical condition, but Lazarus was trained for combat. This was prey caught in a cage with a predator. In the struggle, Rasmussen managed to get Lazarus in a sleeper hold, but Lazarus bit her arm, forcing her to let go. Lazarus smashed the vase over Rasmussen's head and then struck her in the skull with the butt of her revolver. The signs showed the struggle likely went on for several hours, with over 50 separate injuries inflicted upon Rasmussen, during the savage attack. In Rasmussen's final few moments, Lazarus wrapped a quilted duvet around her gun and fired three muffled shots into Rasmussen's heart, face and lungs. Lazarus then got to work on staging the scene to make it look like a robbery gone wrong, and being a detective herself, she knew just how to do it. She knocked over furniture, pulled out drawers, and left behind a stacked VCR and CD player, as though the fictitious robbers had abandoned their loot after murdering Rasmussen. The BMW was taken from the drive and dumped in a random location, not to be found until over a week later. Detectives believe that two robbers, who had attacked another woman in the area and burglarised another house nearby around the same time, were to blame for Rasmussen's death. Weirdly, the only thing taken from the house other than the BMW was the couple's marriage licence. But there was not much else to go on, 
There were no leads, and there was no hair or fibre evidence to connect a suspect to the scene of the crime. A swab was taken from the bite mark on Sherry's arm, but the technology wasn't advanced enough at the time to detect DNA on such a small sample. It seemed like Lazarus had committed the perfect murder. The only thing pointing the finger in Lazarus's direction was Rasmussen's parents, who implored the lead detective on the case to investigate her, but no one would listen. They were fixated on the theory that this was a botched burglary. Much to his frustration, Rasmussen's father was repeatedly told that he had been watching too much crime fiction TV, and that they had already ruled Lazarus out as a suspect. The detectives began putting the family on hold or hanging up when they rang, and stopped responding to letters. After five long years of pleading with the department to no avail, Mr Rasmussen gave up. Over the following years, Lazarus and Rutten's friendship faded. The pair briefly crossed paths in 1989, but their relationship never reignited. While still working for the LAPD, Lazarus started her own private investigations firm, and in 1993, after stints with the department's DEA and Internal Affairs Division, she became a detective. Three years later, she married another detective and adopted a girl with him, before moving back to Simi Valley. Rutten left LA, and remarried sometime later. In the late 90s, DNA technology made significant advances, and the LAPD formed a new unit that looked through forensic evidence collected from cold case files. However, it wasn't until 2004 that a criminalist, Jennifer Francis, would look at the sample taken from Rasmussen's arm. Although it didn't match any DNA in the database, it did reveal that the bite mark was made by a woman. With few burglaries committed by women, Francis suggested to a supervisor that they should look further into female suspects, such as Lazarus, but was told, oh, you mean the LAPD detective, she's not a part of this. After her theory was dismissed, the case went cold again for another five years, until, in 2009, LA crime had fallen so much that detectives had time to reopen cold case files and were told to try and increase their clearance rates. The new detectives began reanalyzing the case and felt that the saliva identifying a woman meant that this was indeed unlikely a burglary. They began looking at the case as a murder staged as a burglary, and they soon realised that a lot of the aspects of the case supported this theory. Rasmussen's jewellery box was in plain view on top of the dresser, but it hadn't been touched. The struggle between Rasmussen and her attacker had begun upstairs and continued downstairs, but the stacked VCR and CD player were at the top of the stairs. This, they thought, would have almost certainly been knocked over during the struggle. In addition, at the top of the stack was a thumb-shaped blood print, suggesting the stacking had taken place after the murder. Had it really been a burglary, the culprits would have surely fled the scene immediately. It didn't make sense. There were also no fingerprints left at the scene of the crime, meaning that someone was likely wearing gloves to avoid leaving any identifying evidence. With their new theory gaining traction, they began identifying and eliminating suspects. From what they knew about the case and the evidence they had at their disposal, five female suspects were identified, and ongoing investigations soon ruled out four of them. With Lazarus the only suspect left, the detectives began delving deeper. They found out that LAPD officers at the time were required to only purchase weapons compatible with the ammunition used in the murder. Records showed that Lazarus owned a 38 caliber weapon, capable of firing such ammunition, but she reported it as missing 13 days after the murder. Since it was reported missing nearby to appear, detectives assumed that Lazarus had thrown the gun into the Pacific Ocean. Without the murder weapon, they needed something else to connect her to the scene of the crime. They informed their supervisors about their findings and arranged to collect a voluntarily discarded DNA sample from Lazarus. One day, whilst out running errands, Lazarus discarded a cup she had been drinking from, and the detectives retrieved it. Using the latest technology, the DNA on the cup was matched to the DNA retrieved from the bite wound found on Rasmussen's arm the day she was murdered. They had her. In June of 2009, Lazarus was called into a lockup at Parker Centre. After over 20 years on the force, Lazarus had been promoted to the high-profile, high-stakes art theft detail, so detectives Greg Stearns and Dan Jeremio told Lazarus they had someone in custody that wanted to talk about an art theft. 
The lockup was chosen because Lazarus would have to give up her gun to enter, and they were concerned that she might react violently to being arrested. In this next part of the video, we're going to have a look at some of the key moments from the interrogation tapes, with reference to psychological analysis by JCS Criminal Psychology, who made an almost one hour long video on the topic. So, Lazarus handed in her weapon and unknowingly entered the interrogation room. I'm not sure. Stephanie, I don't know if you know my partner. Or hey, great. Hi. 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 Stern, nice yeah, to meet you. you guys. How's it going? Good. Good. No, no, no. Uh, well, have a seat. What this is, is, uh, I don't want to bring this up in your squadron. I don't want to talk about this in the squadron because well, I, okay. I don't know who people are listening. That's true. That's and if we go to my side, everybody's yeah. always wondering what everybody oh, else yeah, is sure, doing. No problem. Okay. But, uh, like we're talking about being busy and stuff. We've been assigned a case that we've been looking at. Okay. okay. It's a new case, and as we're doing the case, there's some notes uh, to see that as far as your name being mentioned. Do oh, you, okay. Do you know John Rutten? John Rutten? John Rutten? Rutten. Rutten. Oh, yeah, I went to school with him. You did? Yeah. The detectives at this point already knew how to say Rutten's name correctly, but they wanted to see how Lazarus would react to hearing it mispronounced. A psychiatrist noted that this pause was four times longer than it should have been. Rutten was the second longest relationship in Lazarus's life. She would have made the connection almost instantly. But hearing his name, she had already begun analysing the situation in front of her, leading her to act cautiously around the situation and begin putting on a deceptive display. How long did you know him? Gosh, I went to school in, um, let's see, went to UCLA in 1978 I started and... Um, you know, met him at school, at the dorms. Lazarus dated Rutten for over four years, and the detectives knew this. If she were being entirely truthful and transparent, she most likely would have volunteered this information straight away. Instead, she makes the conscious decision not to, knowing that the stronger her ties to Rutten, the stronger her ties are to the case. Were you guys friends, close friends? Yeah, we're very close friends. I mean, yeah. I mean what's this all about? Well, it's regarding... It's a case we're working on, and it involves John, and in there, some of the statements we, we reviewed, uh, you know, there's notes and stuff that he, that he knew you and stuff. Oh, yeah, I mean, we good friends. Um, Was there ever any relationship or anything that developed between you guys? Yeah, I mean, we dated, uh, uh -huh. you know, um, I mean, is it, what's this all about? Well, it's relating to uh, his wife. It's a shame Lazarus's face wasn't on camera when she received this answer. After realising that she was in a room being questioned by two detectives and being told that their inquiries weren't actually about an art theft as she had been led to believe, but instead were regarding the victim of the horrendous crime she had committed 23 years beforehand, Lazarus would have been shaken to her very core. Her body would have immediately responded to this information with a physiological response known as fight or flight. She would have been overcome with a feeling of dread as a cocktail of stress hormones filled her body. But with no option of escaping the threat without compromising her impression of innocence, her only option was to stay and fight, to mask her uncontrollable physical response as much as possible, and calmly continue with the questioning. Okay. Okay. Did you know her? Not really. I mean, I knew that he got married years ago. Uh-huh. Did you ever meet her? God, I don't know. Um, Do you know who she was or anything? Well, I... Let me think. God, it's been a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, you know, I may have met her. Um, geez. Expressions like God, gosh, and geez are used repeatedly by Lazarus throughout the interrogation. She's trying to imply that she hasn't given thought to the matter at hand in a very long time, which, had she been innocent of the crime, she would have had no reason to. You know. Yeah. Uh, well, let me see. Let me ask you. You said you, you dated John. How long did you guys date? I mean, well, are you guys, is this something, I mean, you said that I was going to interview somebody about art and how well, you guys are, here's, here's. <laughs> I mean. Stephanie had been a detective and an officer for many years. She will have been acutely aware that acting oblivious to the fact that the topic at hand is not the one she was called in to discuss would be a glaring red flag in the eyes of the investigators. Guilty suspects often act oblivious to unusual situations as a means of avoiding the situation altogether, whereas innocent suspects tend to immediately inquire about unusual situations and seek clarification as to the implications of provocative questions. Lazarus's query is met with a reassuring answer, but one that avoids the question entirely. Stephanie, here's the situation. It's basically, 
we you know we knew that this uh, when we saw this in the in in this chrono that maybe you know there was some relationship there that's what the chrono seemed to indicate and we didn't want to come up to you at your desk and ask those kinds of questions or do anything you know how up there people can see what's going on if you go into an interview room or people are in there getting oh, supplies okay. I mean, so we, we wanted to afford you some privacy some confidentiality okay. to talk about this because we thought it might be you know something you know you're married to someone else obviously and so forth and that you may not want to you know talk about these things in that setting where someone you know we don't want the rumor mill or gossip or any of that kind of stuff yeah, to I mean, start. that's fine i mean so we're, we're, we did this just as, as a means to try and speak to you okay, in just a confidential I mean, just place where you you know where where your business isn't out there for other people and well, you know I mean, your division yeah, and all I mean, about. you know god that's been a million years ago i mean you know um what year is it now? 2009? I mean, I graduated in 82. 82, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, we dated. Um, I dated other guys. I'm sure he dated other girls. Um. Mm -hmm. Notice how Lazarus often over-explains herself or goes off on unnecessary tangents when answering questions. This is a sign of terror management theory. These often long-winded tangents offer Lazarus momentary relief from the terrifying situation unfolding before her. Rather than having to answer questions that she must think about carefully to avoid implicating herself, or face the possible reality that she's being interrogated for a murder she thought she had got away with decades ago, the unrelated ramblings allow her brief moments of distraction from the extreme stress and anxiety that's beginning to engulf her. Well, let me ask you, <laughs> roughly how long would you, <clears throat> would you say you guys dated? Jeez, oh, um, I couldn't even say. I mean... I started school there in 78. Mm -hmm. I started UCLA in 1978. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 82. Um, I don't even remember what year he graduated, if it was a year or two before me. Okay. Um, I think he was a little bit older than I was. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I can't remember if he was born, let's say I'm born in 60, 1960. I don't know if he was born in 58 or 59. I mean, I, you know, um, I mean, I knew his parents, I knew his sister, his brother went to Northridge. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, his sister spent the night at my house before. Obviously, I spent the night at his house before. He probably spent the night at my house before. Um, you know, I, I yeah. you know, I don't, I, I mean, wh wh you know, what's, uh, what's, I mean, what's this all about? I mean. Well, let me ask you that. After going off on several tangents again, Lazarus asks for clarification a second time. The first time, detectives avoided the question, but gave her reassuring answers about protecting her privacy and giving reasons for the interview's location. But this time, no reassurance is given. What ended the relationship between you and John? You know, I don't... It was kind of a weird relationship. I mean, we, we, we dated. Um, I can't say that he was my boyfriend. I don't know that he would consider me his girlfriend. Um, we just, we dated, we did things. I played sports in college. He played basketball. His brother played basketball. Um, it, it, we just, you know, it just didn't work out. Had you ever met his wife? I may have. Do you know, do you remember her name or anything? Or um, um, Or what she did for a living or where she worked or anything uh, about her? Notice how Lazarus' facial expression changes as the third question is posed. This is because her expression changes from pretending to be giving thought to the first two questions to actually giving thought to the third one. When asked whether she had met Rasmussen before or whether she remembered her name, Lazarus would have known the answer immediately. She almost certainly would have thought about Rasmussen and the day of the murder almost every day since, even after all this time. So once again, Lazarus had to give the impression that she was giving thought to vague memories to provide an answer. But when asked what Rasmussen did for a living, being such an insignificant detail, Lazarus genuinely had to think about whether she knew the answer. Had you ever met his wife? I may have. Do you know, do you remember her name or anything or? Um, um, or what she did for a living, or where she worked, or anything uh, about her? Well, I think she, I th I'm going to say that I think she was a nurse. Um, I mean, I can't even remember how he, he said he met her. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's been so long ago. You know, I, I don't understand why you're talking about some guy I dated a million years ago. Well, do you know what happened to his wife? Yeah, I know she got killed. What, um, did, you, what did you hear about that? I, I saw a poster at work. Um, 
I'm sure I spoke to him about it. Um, I think I spoke to another friend of his about it. Um, and how did how did you first learn about that? Jeez, <laughs> someone could have called me. I could have heard it at work. Um, I think at one point there may have been a flyer or something. You know, I don't remember how I heard. I mean, I don't even remember what year it was. And you think you you thought you said you thought his wife was a nurse. Do you have any idea where she was working at the time, or did he um, ever mention that to you? Was it a hospital or a doctor's office? I'm or? sure he must have mentioned it. Now, now that you're bringing that up, I think she worked at a hospital somewhere. And yeah, I may have met her at a hospital. Um, I may have talked to her once or twice. Um, at, a, at a hospital. Or more. Um, but you be, know. But being that you're kind of you used to see uh, John, you know, was it everything okay between you guys? I mean, there was never anything uncomfortable or anything between you and her. Um. You know, I don't know. I mean, it's God. It's been so many years. I mean, uncomfortable. I mean. I, I can't even I can't even remember if we had a conversation I mean we may have I may have I may have seen her at his apart I, you know it, I, geez how many years ago is that I don't even know what year she you know got killed here Lazarus is trying to cover her tracks by downplaying the conflict between her and Rasmussen as we've already mentioned Lazarus went to Rasmussen's place of work which ended in a violent confrontation where security had to escort Lazarus off the scene Although it was many years ago, this almost certainly would have stayed in Lazarus's memory as a significant incident in the sequence of events that led to the murder. Giving detectives information to suggest they had a strong disagreement gives the detectives reason to suspect a motive. But there are some things that Lazarus would be unable to deny, so instead, she employs an intelligent tactic to deal with these types of questions. Throughout the interrogation, Lazarus frequently refers back to past events, suggesting that they may have happened without confirming or denying whether, to her knowledge, they did. For example, she's already said things like, someone may have called me, I may have found out at work, I may have met her in a hospital. And she does this to avoid giving detectives any information which may implicate her further. She's not incriminating herself by admitting that she went to the hospital to confront Rasmussen, but she's also not denying it in case the detectives have evidence saying that she did. Similarly, she's not claiming to have found out about the murder in any specific way, in case the detectives are able to disprove her claims, arousing further suspicion. It's a clever tactic that Lazarus uses repeatedly throughout the interrogation. Do you know what the circumstances were? regarding her death? Mm. Jeez, oh, let me think back. Um, geez, I don't know if it was, you know, if it was a burglary or something. Maybe if you told me I would remember it. Um, Do you remember you know, the first name? <sighs> Shelly, um, Sherry, I don't know, something maybe, you know, um, like I said, it's been so many years and... Um, from all the years, as far as you can remember, you don't. Do you, do you remember ever talking to her? Just you mentioned a hospital. Maybe you may have talked to her at a hospital. Yeah. Um, yeah, I may have. You know, I, I'm. I'm thinking back now. You guys are bringing up all these whole memories. No, it kind of dusts um, off the cobwebs. You know, I mean, geez. Um, I'm thinking that because I mean, we would date. He would date other people. I would date other people, mm -hmm. and. I think, you know, at one point, I mean, he may have been dating her, or I don't know, maybe he was married, I don't even remember. And I'm like, you know what, why are you calling me if you're either dating her or living with her or married to her? Because I, I, I honestly don't remember the time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, oh, come on, knock it off. And, I'm, and now I'm thinking, I, put, may, I may have gone to her and said, hey, you know what, you know what, is he dating you? He's, he's bothering me. Um, and so I'm thinking that we had a conversation about that, um, one or two maybe, I, I, you know, I, it could have been three. I don't want to say I had three conversations with her. Oh. Like, I, at, I like at her work or at their, at their house or? No, I'm thinking that I'm, you know, he obviously must have told me where she worked. I'm thinking it was a hospital somewhere in L.A. I mean, I could have been working in Hollywood, it sounds like, if, if that's where I was working. Um... So I could have said, okay, well, you know, and I went and talked to her um, and just said, hey, you know what, I, you know, if he's dating you, he's, he's keeps calling me, why don't you tell him to knock it off or whatever? And, you know, because I probably would have told him to knock it off. 
Once again, Lazarus is attempting to massively underplay the animosity she showed towards Rasmussen that day. Eight separate witnesses testified that she confronted Rasmussen at the hospital that day, and that she was by far the more combative of the two. The fact that a violent confrontation took place not long before the murder, as well as the fact that Lazarus made threats against Rasmussen's life, would have been another glaring red flag in the eyes of the investigators. Quite when, honestly, I don't even remember. When you said, like, hey, you know, he's calling me, he needs to knock it off, or what have you, I mean, was that, was that civil? Was there, I mean, Oh, yeah, it... no, there was not. I don't think there was anything. It was, if the conversation lasted a, a, a few minutes, I can't even remember. And what is it like, you know, we went out to lunch or anything. Right, but there was but, no, like, arguments or fights I, I or it didn't so. get heated or anything like not that. Not that I recall, no. I mean, what? I would think that would stand out, I would think. Now, again, that's not standing out in my mind. Um, you know... Um, but again, I mean, you know, uh, uh, what's I mean, what's this got to do with me dating him and you know her getting killed? I mean, I I don't you know I don't have anything to do with it. And you got something that's somebody said you know whatever. I mean, Lazarus's questions have become more confrontational as she realizes that she still has yet to have any clarification as to the situation, and the detective's questions have become more hostile. This time, she's essentially asking if the detectives have any evidence against her, or if there's someone out there pointing the finger at her. Well, like we said, we, we just literally got this the other day, and, and you're going through it, yeah. and you see and you saw me say, your oh, name. Nick's next door. Right, and, and <laughs> so, you know, I mean, obviously it's like we recognize yeah. the name, and we know that, you know, you work yeah. next door to us, and so... We're trying to get some background. We're trying to figure this out. I mean, this is from a long time ago. Oh, I know. And you know, and, and, and things have been kind of slow for us. And so, you know, Chief Beck has said, hey, you know, I want you guys working. I don't want you just sitting around reading the paper. Yeah. So he's kind of pushing some older cases out even to the guys that yeah. work active cases because, you know, and so we see this and we're just like, oh, yeah. well, we, you know, we want to talk to you about it. But, of course, the only reason we did it here is because we're getting into some pretty personal stuff no, in I your relationship. You know, my, I, my and, husband's yeah. on the job yeah. and we've and, and been so married we don't, you know, we don't a want long take the risk. time. We don't want to take the risk when one of those interview rooms, no, and even when the door closed, it. someone's going to get no. supplies and see us on a monitor or hears yeah. or whatever. No, I appreciate it. I mean, I you know, appreciate it. Like I said. That's where people go when there's orals. You know, when they're doing orals, <laughs> yeah. guys will go in there and oh, try and watch. Like, I, oh, what are the answers to the questions, you know? I didn't know that. Lazarus once again accepts the explanation without being given any reassurances. The detectives then use the hospital incident as a segue to ask Lazarus if she had ever visited the couple's home. Do you know uh, where they were living? Because I know you, you went to talk to her at, at the hospital uh, regarding this issue with John. To, you know, kind of like, hey, you know, what's going to happen here with this thing? But would this ever have followed up to her house when you went to talk to her to say, hey, you know what? I, I don't even know that I knew where they lived. I, you know, that's what I'm saying. I don't, if I knew where they lived and I'd been there, if it was for something social, I, I would, I'm, I'm, and I can't see how many times I, I saw her face to face. You know, he lived on Roscoe. Did I ever see her there? I don't know. I mean, I may have seen her at his apartment on Roscoe. Mm -hmm. I may have met her there. I, you know, I, I mean. But you didn't have any issues with her, right? No, I mean, uh, you know, obviously, if he was dating me and dating her, I probably said, hey, pick or something, you know, fair. you know, back That's then. Um, yeah. I can't say that we ever screamed or, yeah, you know, it's... The detectives soon move on to talking about Lazarus as a person. Lazarus was known in her office, as she was growing up, for her erratic behaviour when she became flustered or angry. So much so that her peers even coined her a nickname, which now would quite rightly be considered ableist and offensive. So instead of repeating it, I'll just show it censored on screen. Oddly, Lazarus doesn't seem to have any problem talking openly with the detectives about her slightly unhinged personality and unpredictable tendencies. Because the times I've seen you around in our office... I'm crazy! <laughs> you know, but you're always you know. kind of like real... I mean, you seem kind of bubbly. Oh, I'm, pr I'm you know, people think I'm really hyper, um, but I can, I mean, I can get, I can get upset, you know, and, and, and then I forget five seconds later, you know, you know how guys razz you and you go, ah, you know, um, I mean, I've done that in the office, you know, but it's like, and then I'm, you know, and then I'm, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I, I mean, people Water think, under the bridge. Yeah, I mean, it's like people think I'm crazy, and then they think I'm crazy at home, and I'm, you know, more, I'm, I'm a hyper person at work, I'm, you know, I, I enjoy my job, I get excited, I, you know, um, I, I enjoy the job, I've always enjoyed the job. Um, well, you got a good gig, so. <laughs> you know. 
At this stage, detectives decided that it was time to ramp up the interrogation, finally giving Lazarus some explanation as to why she was there and posing some more serious questions. Like I said, as we were looking at the case and, you know, we had read the notes as far as from uh, Sherry's friends saying you, you guys had problems or words and they got heated. You know, and the reason we're asking you is they had mentioned that an incident at her work had occurred and uh, they've also told us that an incident at her house occurred. You know what? And this is at her house <laughs> during the period of time that they're married. <laughs> That's just not sounding familiar at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know what, I... Did you, ever, did you ever fight with her? You mean like we fought? Yeah, did you ever yeah. duke it out with her? No, I don't think so, I mean... You'd remember that, right? That would be pretty... Yeah, I would think so. Pretty I mean, specific, it, you know, Yeah, like I said, I mean, dramatic. obviously... I, you know, I mean, it just doesn't sound familiar. I mean, I mean, what are they saying? So I, I, I fought with her. So, so now I mean, I, 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 I'm get, getting the jump, the leap. They're saying, okay, I fought with her, so I must have killed her. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, you know, I, I don't even know who these people are. I, I can't even say I met any of these people. I mean, that's it's insane. Mm -hmm. No, because I'm, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm looking at the notes, and these people are kind of, I mean, they're pointing the finger at you. <laughs> well, and. <laughs> I mean, that's not ringing a bell to me, so, uh -huh. you know, I don't know, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, that just sounds crazy to me. Yeah, so you, offhand, you don't recall ever going into her house and having words and physically, you know, no, attacking I mean, her, her attacking you? No. Nothing like that? No, I mean, that's, no. Nothing? No. With Lazarus still in complete denial, and without having made much progress, the detectives finally decide to go all out, as they bring the interrogation to its climax. Well, on some of the, uh, on this case, you know, this is, it occurred in 86, right? Uh, the detectives processed the scene, things of that nature. Uh, they did fingerprints and all that stuff. You know, as they processed everything, uh, they did the best they could at that time, and they looked at a lot of a lot of people and different things in this case. And you're right. I mean, if you guys are claiming that I'm a suspect, then you know I, I got a problem with you know with that. Okay. Okay. So, you know, if you're if you're doing this as an interrogation, <laughs> you're saying, hey, I'm a suspect. Well, I, now I got a problem with you know now you're accusing me of this. Is that what you're is that what you're saying? We're trying to figure out what happened, Stephanie. Uh, well, I'm, I was, you know, I'm just saying, uh, you know, do what I need to get a lawyer if you're I, accusing me of I this? I mean, you know. You don't have to, I mean, you know, I'm just, you're here of your own free will. I mean, no, you well, I know, but I mean. I mean you know you're, not, you're not under arrest. You can walk out You can leave you whenever you like. Well, but you know, I, I'm trying <coughs> to give you some background of, you know, how I knew him, and now you're telling me that some somebody's saying that we had this big old fight, and I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, you know, and I don't want to, you know, get in trouble for something that I didn't even do, or you're saying I did something. Okay. Yeah, we understand. I mean, how would you guys like it if the tables were turned on you? I understand. No. Um, no, that's what we're telling you. I mean, you're free to go whenever yeah. you want. If if this makes you uncomfortable and you want to, if well, you want now you're starting leave. to make me uncomfortable. The thing is, I mean, detectives did what they could at that time on the crime scene. Okay, and, and the burglary thing you're talking about—that is an angle that they looked at. I go, but now we're looking at everything else on the case. Because nobody was ever arrested on the case. I, I don't know that or not. Okay. Now, what we'd like to do is, obviously you know about all the DNA stuff and things of the nature that, you know, gets done on cases nowadays. You know, if we asked you for a, a DNA swab, would you be willing to give us one? Maybe. Because <laughs> now, 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 yeah, because now, now I'm thinking I probably need to talk to a lawyer. I mean, well, I because I know how this stuff works. Okay, don't get me wrong. You're right. I have been doing this a long time, yeah. and, I, and I wish I had been recording this because because now it sounds like you know there's you know you're selling these people say I'm fighting with her, and now <sighs> it sounds like you're trying to you know I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, we know. Okay, and it, and now it almost sounds like you're trying to pin something on me. No, now I, I got that sense. Well, what it gets to on these on these cases, and you know it as well as I do. Our job is to identify and eliminate suspects. I can't believe this. So if we ask you to the point to give us a DNA sample, a buccal swab, 
so we can identify or eliminate you, would you be willing to do that? Maybe. Because I know this. I, 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 I well, that's where we're at, too. I mean, because right now, from looking at the evidence, it's, you know, it's possible we may have some DNA at the location. That's great. And we're going to do what we can to try to put this thing together. And your name's in the book. These people are pointing at you for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why. And that's just crazy. I mean, that's just, that's absolutely crazy. And it would be irresponsible on our part not to look at it. I know. You guys have to do your job. And, and I guess I'm going to have to contact somebody. So That's fair. I mean, because uh, I know how this stuff works. Sure. I mean, I, 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 I just can't believe it. That's I, I mean, we, we understand that. I mean, if we were in your position, I mean, we would feel the same way. I just can't even believe it. I mean, it's just, I, I mean, I'm shocked. I'm really shocked okay. that somebody would be blame, saying that I did this. I mean, we had a fight, and so I went and killed her. I mean, come on. Well, That's... Okay. All right. Well, thanks for giving me the courage. I wish I could take Thanks that. for your time. Yeah, thank you. All right, Stephanie. Take care. All right. Unfortunately for Lazarus, the ending of the questioning was but a brief moment of relief. As soon as she stepped outside the interrogation room, Stephanie Lazarus was arrested and charged with the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. This is absolutely crazy. Have a seat, Stephanie. This is insane. Okay. Okay, Stephanie, you know you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand? Yes. Anything you say may be used against you in court. Do you understand? Yes. You have the right to the presence of an attorney before and during any questioning. Do you understand? Yes. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you free of charge before any questioning if you want. Do you understand? Yes. Do you want to talk to us right now? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. This then. is crazy. Okay. This is absolutely... I'm like, I'm like in shock. I'm totally in shock. Immediately after her arrest, teams of officers that had arisen before dawn and been told to await a command to execute a search warrant began searching Lazarus's home, workspace and car. Amongst the discoveries was a journal that Lazarus had kept during the mid-80s that documented several times her obsessive love for Rutten and her despair at his engagement with Rasmussen. Her personal computer was also searched and revealed that she had looked up Rutten's name several times throughout the 90s. Lazarus was then taken to Linwood, the LA County Jail facility for female prisoners, to await trial with bail set at an astronomical $10 million. On June 9th, 2009, Stephanie Lazarus appeared in court at the Criminal Justice Centre for her arraignment on murder charges. Wearing an orange jumpsuit, Lazarus appeared severely distressed with eyes wide open and cold. She spoke just once, answering the judge about the continuance with, yes, your honor. In early 2012, the trial began in the LA County Superior Court. The prosecutor for the case, Shannon Presby, said in his opening argument, a bite, a bullet, a gun barrel, and a broken heart. That's the evidence that will prove to you that defendant Stephanie Lazarus murdered Sherry Rasmussen. During the five-week trial, 60 witnesses testified and 400 exhibits were presented from the state and the defence. Lazarus's defence attorney, Mark Overland, tried to show during cross-examination that his client was not the obsessed, jilted lover portrayed by the prosecutors. Throughout the trial, he repeatedly questioned the integrity of the DNA evidence from the bite mark, arguing that the vial it was stored in was not properly sealed and the envelope containing the sample was ripped. He also noted that a blood smear from an unidentified male was analysed for DNA and did not match the blood of either Lazarus or Rasmussen, suggesting the possibility of another suspect. As his last witness, he called to the stand a fingerprint expert, who said that some of the fingerprints at the scene of the crime didn't match those of Lazarus. But in the end, the DNA from the bite mark proved too difficult for the defence to overcome. On the 9th of March 2012, after little more than a day of deliberation, a panel of eight women and four men found Stephanie Lazarus guilty of murder in the first degree. During testimony heard prior to sentencing, 
A devastated and heartbroken John Rutten said, The fact that Sherry's death occurred because she met and married me brings me to my knees. On the 11th of May 2012, Stephanie Lazarus was sentenced to 27 years in prison for the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. With credit for time already served, she'll be eligible for parole in 2034. And as the story of this cold case comes to an end, so too does this video. If you enjoyed watching, please do consider subscribing down below. For all of the time, energy and effort that went into this video, one small click makes all the difference for me and the channel. I genuinely would appreciate it so much. And also, in return, you'll get the next true crime video I do delivered straight to your homepage. Thank you to everyone who's chosen to subscribe today and to all of those who have been subscribed since before this video. Thank you for watching and hopefully I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.